And that's why I don't trust anyone wearing Dodger hats, just because it's it's like, do you do you need to have every single like piece? Do you need to have a team with fifty million diamond jewels? Can you just like go ahead and win a World Series without a payroll of three hundred million dollars? And this is coming from a Yankee fan, by the way. I now know what it's like to be a Met fan because Hal has turned into Jeff Wilpon. Well, Hal is Jeff Wilpon. Hal is Jeff Wilpon. And I am so sorry for all the years I gave Met fans crap. And I, I will forever be sorry about that because of what has become of this franchise being pinning pitcher, uh, pinchers and, and the fact that the, the luxury tax threshold is by far more important than putting a competitive ball club on the field a championship contending ball club on the field. We're okay with being a third place team. That is the golden Yankee standard now. But anyway, would you like, would you like to, would you like a retort in this cold open? Uh, I, I, I just don't understand why I, I caught a stray the way that I did, but it's, it's alarming to me now that almost every single LA sport franchise is just all in with the exception of the angels for some reason. But yeah, Forget a draft pick. Let's just spend money. Let's I mean, money. when you do such a great job of developing pitchers like the Yankees have done over the last 25 years, remind me, uh, what pitcher has had long-term success that's come from the Yankees farm since Andy Pettit? I'll wait. That's actually an excellent question. I can't I'll think wait. of one. A lot of them have been acquired in, in trades and, you know, free agent signings and, you know, lack of arbitration meetings and team and, uh, you know, players just being fed up. Okay. The two most successful long-term Yankee pitchers since, since Andy Pettit, and I'm not counting Roger Clemens because he had two shorts since the Yankees, but uh, the two most successful are CeCe Sabathia, who we acquired, and Mike Mussina, who we acquired. Uh, and then anyone else you want to fill in there, go go for it. But I consider those to be one and two in terms of success with the Yankees. Um, but anyway, with that, this is episode uh, of Ethan and Nick's Trash Boat Podcast. Uh, I'm Ethan at I'm Finkelstein on Twitter. This is my co-host Nick Graves at Nick's Tape 15 on Twitter. And uh, I want to say we're back more frequently, but that remains to be seen. Hopefully we can kind of bust our ass to get back in here in two weeks and actually fulfill that schedule. But we'll see. But, um, you know, I want to start this off by paying homage to not just a great NFL reporter, but one of the great reporters in all of professional sports, uh, John Clayton, um, passed away on, you know, March 19th, um, had a, a short fight uh, with an illness, uh, you know, next to his loved ones and family, um, you know, when it all happened. And John Clayton was unique in the sense that as he was called the professor, he legitimately looked like a professor, but he was a reporter that could report five stories all year next to some of the great reporters in the same field that would report 45 to 50. But when John Clayton spoke, you listen. He had a very unique way of breaking down what seemed to be complicated in NFL trades and deadlines and um, acquisitions into very digestible, meaningful sentences. But he was a little quirky in that he lived up to his persona. I love that. Um, I was just talking about uh, the the commercial where he's living in his mom's basement. It is the greatest. <laughs> this is Sports Center commercial of all time, or this is ESPN commercial of all time. Ma, I'm finished with my segment. It's, it's, it's the goat. He's playing rock music or metal music in the background with this cup of noodles and it's just headbanging. And it's like you don't oh, the mullet, that. The, yeah, mullet the mullet is everything. Yeah. <laughs> it was so good. And I, that's one of the things. And again, I'm not not to completely boil down his 50-year reporting legacy to one commercial, but that is part of it. 
I'm going to remember that quite a bit yeah. it, with regards to, to, to his career. And again, not to short sell the fact that the man spent, again, 50 years reporting on the NFL, most of it for his local Seahawks franchise. Um, but like you said, the man had a certain way about him, a certain delivery that was, um, it was a little dorky, but at the same time, it was also kind of like he was our local dork quote unquote, and I said that affectionately, our local dork reporting on the sidelines in a way that wasn't really captured by any other uh, reporter. It's funny because you go back to when he had a show in the 90s with Sean Salisbury, and the fact is you had the backup QB, uh, journeyman QB (laughs) in the NFL, and you had this like five foot something poindexter who looked like he should be teaching history in college as opposed to reporting on the NFL. And the banter between the two of them between him being called basically Poindexter, every every synonym for nerd under the book, and him affectionately referring to Sean Salisbury as backup. Uh, it was a really cool dynamic, even if it got heated at times. And uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm gonna miss him. He he was up there with the with the Chris Mortensons, with the uh, Adam Schefters. Uh, of the uh, reporting worlds and uh, such a titan. It really is is quite a loss. Big, big shoes. And, you know, I wish back in the day, circa 2014, um, when I had my sports radio show, um, at, you know, our alma mater, um, Ohio, the Ohio State, um, it hit me hard when Stuart Scott passed away. He was one of my biggest, biggest role models, biggest um, influencers um, to go into, you know, sports journalism and broadcast. And I definitely remember the episode that uh, that we recorded um, with my co-host at the time, Cam. And every single reference from, from Stuart Scott just hit us, you know, cool as the other side of the pillow. Um, booyah. Booyah. Uh, Pookie and Ray Ray, um, you know, just his personality. And then you have somebody who you would think lacks personality in a John Clayton, but he just had his own way of, you know, his exuberant creativity. But again, as I, you know, mentioned before, he was like a professor, but he was the our local dork that understood how to break down information very well. Like nothing was grandiose in approach with them. It was, this is who you got. This is the information that I have. And I'm going to regurgitate it to you in the best way possible. And the biggest piece of credit um, that I like to give John Clayton is his ability to sit on a story. It didn't matter if it took four days, four weeks, or four months. John Clayton was going to ensure that he saw whatever that story was from start to finish, and when it was time to disseminate the information, he was going to be the person that disseminated the information. You mentioned Adam Schefter. Like Adam Schefter is, you know, the woge bomb for the NFL. Yet there were moments where John Clayton would drop a bomb and it's like, yo, wait a minute. How did he find this out before Schefter? Like Sheffy is really good at what he does. But I always admire the different approaches Um, with, you know, infield reporting and out of field reporting within, you know, professional sports. And John Clayton was definitely the guy where he may not look like he was on the guest list, but he was definitely one of the few names at the top of that guest list. How how is he getting in? Who who is this guy? He was one of the greatest reporters that we've seen in the NFL. And, um, you know, rest in peace, you know, to John Clayton, you know, Although it was a short fight with the illness that he was dealing with, um, you know, I'm pretty sure he went out the way he wanted to go out uh, with his family by his side, Um, you know, but also more importantly, you know, you pay attention to your legends and your heroes in the game of whatever, you know, you respect, and John Clayton will definitely be forever missed. Agreed. Agreed. As I said a few minutes ago, Titan of the, of the NFL industry, of the reporting industry for the NFL, and, and a pioneer at that. Seth, he was 67, and he started this journey at 17. This is yeah. all, not all he knew, 
but this was his life. And yeah. it's it's brought again between the commercials, between all of the the, the ESPN, you know, breaking news alerts in the NFL. You could count on Adam Schefter, but you knew if John Clayton's name was behind it, oh man. Oh man, this is this is a surgeon at work. Absolutely, uh, it's it's kind of like uh, if I can um, equate him to college football. It's kind of like if you see a piece by Schlereth. I enjoy those quite a bit when covering college football, yes. or when when referring back to college football coverage. Yes. Um, or 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 Ryan Mickey, especially the bottom ten. <laughs> oh, the bottom ten might be one of my favorite favorite articles to read weekly on ESPN. It is, <laughs> I get such a big kick out of it because it's never, it's, it's never like, you know, out of it's not, spite. It's not malicious. Yes, it is it's not malicious. Always, That's the word I was looking for. It is always, it is always lighthearted and it is what it is. It's always basically, it's, it's brutally honest, but it's in a way that's not supposed to be a jab a personal jab at any program yeah. um and and unfortunately osu has found itself on occasion on that list um i'd say if i remember correctly probably after the virginia tech game ironically enough the year that we actually won the national championship yeah, but uh, but with that i actually want to transition to something um that just happened last night as well um it is uh, pretty, it's it's insignificant with regards to the championship landscape, but significant on a personal statistical level, and that is LeBron James uh, passing uh, Karl Malone for number two all time in regular season points. Uh, he is essentially about eighty percent of an NBA season away from, for his standards, eighty percent of a season away from uh, the number one spot in Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, um, and and honestly, it just. It's weird to think this, Nick, but I almost think this doesn't have any impact on his legacy in terms of the dude was set in stone before this. And I, and I don't want to sound fatigued, but it was kind of coming. It was expected. I think most of us at this point have resigned ourselves. And resigned, I guess, is not the word I'd use because I'm excited for it, but have, have pretty much operated under the assumption he's going to be the league's all-time leading scorer. He's not done yet. He's got at least one or two more years, it, the expectation is going to play with his son. So you figure he's got a couple more seasons left. It, it seemed like a fait accompli. And so that's why I'm excited about it. But at the same time, I'm not, holy crap, look at this. Because it was coming. You know? And and maybe, maybe, maybe I'm not really fully absorbing the significance of it because we've been spoiled with someone like a Kobe. We've been spoiled with somebody like a Dirk. A lot of these guys who climbed up this all-time points scored list recently. Yeah. But but at the same I, I time, agree with you on that. at the same time, we've been anointing this man next in line for 20 years. He was still in high school when we were anointing him the chosen one. Exactly. You know, and at the time we were anointing him, that draft class 2002 was no slouch. Right. That you, incoming high school class, you know, into college and the pros of 2002, no slouch. His best friends were in those classes. And, and you know what the funny thing is? I could not think of a better way for him to have scored those points because to me that is the perfect uh, – it, it embodies LeBron to a certain extent. It is – to me, to a certain extent, almost an understated brilliance because of how much we talk about him. Mm-hmm. It's a cut to the basket and a layup. It wasn't nothing, and it wasn't a fancy play. It wasn't anything super showboaty. It wasn't anything where you thought, oh my God, highlight real play. But that's the thing. He's, he's been doing it for so long, so consistently. We're not taken aback by it at this point because of how long he's been doing it. And, and truth be told, can you think of anyone that had that kind of draft hype historically, at least in the modern era of sports, who has actually lived up to it? Because most of the time when we blow people up to be the next big thing, they fail to meet that expectation, as seismic as it is. I can legitimately not think of anyone who has met that hype nearly as well as LeBron James has. That's an excellent question. And of course, you know, people can rightfully say, uh, Michael Jordan or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, but when you're talking about where the game is now, 
thinking about where the game was for LeBron when LeBron and that 2003 draft class started, it's a totally different game. The game has changed twice since LeBron's been in that 2003 class has been in the NBA. Um, it didn't seem as if him passing Carmelo for number two all time was going to be a significant roar um, only because of how LeBron, as you mentioned, you know, came into the league and embraced the fact that he was the chosen one, how he's been able to carry that weight on his shoulders for as long as he has. We have to also remember, too, that he was 18 when he got drafted. He's 37. We've seen this man play in the NBA longer than he's been alive. Right. And We've the funny seen thing- this man grow up. Well, and it's funny because you mentioned Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and you mentioned uh, MJ. Maybe with, with Kareem because of the college success in terms of being arguably the greatest college player of all time. But MJ, remember, MJ was drafted third. There was a legitimate argument about if he was actually the best player in his class um, with, with him and Hakeem. Um, LeBron James was far and away the number one prospect in his respective class. It was the most hyped up NBA prospect of all time, which is why I, 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 I I'd asked that because legitimately I can't think of anyone in the history of sports that had that much pre-draft hype in the modern era and met pretty much all of it. If, if he failed in any way, it's with the people who were expecting him to eclipse Michael Jordan's legacy, which realistically speaking is setting anyone up for failure. But the fact is, is that even if you don't view him as the GOAT, He's right there, man. He's solidly no less than a top three, four all-time player. Yeah. Period. So, you know, it's when you think about greatness and you think about, you know, where the ties come into that, you don't expect a franchise like the Cleveland Cavaliers to have that tie to a player like that, right? Not because they aren't worth having a player like that, but because of the size of the market. Everything is always going to come down to the market, right? You look at um, that that draft class as a whole. You have the first three picks are Cleveland, Detroit, Denver. We're talking mid major market, so to speak, in the in the class of an NBA, if you're if you want to equate it to what college basketball would look like, right? Between and, them two championships total at that point. Yeah. All and both with Detroit. So and that's 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 the other thing too. You know, we're talking about um when you with the with the with the beautiful cold open, it's kind of funny how it foreshadows um spending money. The Pistons were the antithesis of that. You know, you're talking about a team who when you recognize this 75th anniversary team, they were the only championship team to not have a player in that 75th anniversary class. You know, they did something very unique where all starting five were listed as all-stars. You know, that, that was very unique. Wait, you know, there wasn't a single 70, there wasn't a single piston in the 75th anniversary team? Well, from that championship team. 2004. Oh, yeah. okay. I was yeah, like, so Isaiah, Thomas, Thomas, Isaiah Thomas is, is on that list, and so is Dave Bing. But, um, you know, we're talking about championship teams. That 04 team doesn't have a single 75th anniversary player on that team. Mm-hmm. But that's just a testament to, again, not letting the market, you know, run over what kind of success you feel like you want to have because the Pistons also did something that, that kind of started a trend too, where when you need that, that, that game changing franchise moving player, you do it mid season during the NBA draft, but you make it loud. Like getting Rasheed Wallace was not quiet. Like I remember that week leading up to the trade thinking, Holy crap, living in Detroit at the time, like, Holy crap. The Pistons are going to win with the Red Wings winning at the same time and the Detroit Shock winning at the same time. Like, we might be title town. And you saw the swing. Then what, ironically enough, we're talking about Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, LeBron James, and, you know, representing, you know, L.A. now. That's what the Lakers effectively did with Pau Gasol and Kobe's last two championships, right? So... It's, it, it's amazing when you think about the legacy 
and what ties and chains and links are to it. LeBron has done something that, you know, I can only imagine if it's not the start of the ABA or the NBA that Michael Jordan has done too. Chicago didn't have a championship pedigree before Michael Jordan, you know, set foot, you know, in United Center. Um, the Cavaliers, you know, had decent playoff experience and, 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 and some, you know, memories, but some of those memories were on the losing end. You know, and even during LeBron's first, you know, stint with the with the Cavs, like I still think is like the 2007 playoff series against the Pistons. Although that that series haunts me to this day, it's indicative of his success. Like I still remember watching those games. Like man, I'm I'm witnessing greatness. I'm a witness. And then he comes back and wins a championship. You know, in 2016 with the Cavs, and that's it. Like, you can't write a better story. Right. And that championship in and of itself in 2016 is probably one of the toughest earned championships in the history of the league. Like, it's it's up there with, I like, that 90 – it's up there with that 94 Rockets squad uh, with the 2010-2011 um, uh, Dallas Mavericks. Like, it's up there with the all-time great gritty championship runs. And uh, I'd say it's probably one of LeBron's most magical performances. I think the one that really I wish ended in a championship because of how much he carried the team. If you remember that last season in Cleveland in 17, 18, um, yeah. how he went into absolute, absolute God mode. It was basically, all right, I'm the only one here. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and uh, I think his brilliance has lasted and lingered so long it's almost at this point like we're not surprised so I, I think you hate to admit it but we've taken it for granted we're at the point where we're taking it all for granted and I really do believe it's going to hit us very hard the day he does decide to hang it up for good and I think people are going to have to step back and realize like okay judge him how you want to compare it to Michael fair or not fair but damn it judge him to the rest of the history of the league and this man is literally in his own universe. Like with MJ there, you got Kareem up here. You, you've got LeBron with them too. And I, I think that people are going to finally, when it's all sudden, when he's finally not playing in the public eye 24 seven with games, that's when it's going to really hit us that we had something special. And that's, that's the, that's the one thing that I wish he got that Brady got. Brady gets that treatment as being this larger than life, hands down the goat. Everyone basically just worships the ground he walks on. And I think it's, it's almost unanimous, even outside of New England, even outside of Tampa Bay. LeBron still gets that heavy criticism all the time. And, 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 and unlike Brady, you have so many people who, who try to detract from the legacy. Well, yeah. I, I want to touch on something. I, I don't mean to, 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 to interject, but – the difference between the NFL and the NBA is the the NFL, of course, has more players per team, right? Mm -hmm. You could effectively say that one NBA, like three NBA rosters of just players is still a few players less or short of it an takes NFL about roster, four. Right? It takes, yeah, it's, it's about four NBA rosters yeah. to, to equal one NFL team, basically. It's easier to cast who the villain is in the NBA than it is in the NFL, right? But the one thing I will give the NBA the benefit over every single professional um, sport that's not soccer <laughs> is that when you see the youth, you feel comfortable. Like knowing when LeBron and Melo finally wrap it up to, 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 to complete that 2003 draft class and that beautiful legacy, um, and I, and I want to uh, kind of, you know, circle back on that 2003 class after the fact. But um, when you think about it in the terms of, you know, the potential of LeBron James retiring and Melo retiring and already seeing uh, Dwayne Wade retire, the NBA is going to be in really good hands when they all call it. You know, I'm, I'm loving where these budding superstars are right now um, with uh, first and foremost, the anointed next one of uh, <laughs> by Allen Iverson with John Morant 
You know, I am very, very high on the fact that we have guys like villain, you know, Trey Young and, and Luka Doncic who are, you know, carrying this, this, this metaphorical torch of, you know, continuing the star power and, and, and powerful Giannis. brand market. Giannis, Giannis is only 26, 27 only 26, years old. And he's yeah. done things that only Hakeem and, and Kareem have done. You know, we're, we're talking about a guy who, you know, as I will always say, I will always say this, and I'm going to stick to this for the test of time. The worst player, it doesn't matter what sport you play, the worst player to ever go up against is a player who plays the game with 100% joy and does it visibly with a smile on their face. Yeah, yes. you have those players where, you know, you got the nasty dunk and, you know, the and one and the drop crossover. But a, when you see a player who is just naturally happy with how they're playing and the appreciation for the game, but they also happen to be that top name, that is something that you circle on the scouting report. The moves well, don't matter. I, that's what I'm circling. Well, there's also two other players that embody that, and it's no coincidence that they're also, in my eyes, the. if you're talking about the three best players in the world right now, I think legitimately the argument is, is that it's Giannis, Joel Embiid, and Nikola Jokic. And they all play with that same kind of, I'm just happy to be playing this freaking game. Um, and and it, it shows, I guess, on their faces in different ways, but you get that sense of pure joy about getting to do what they do for a living. Mm -hmm. They're also three of the most efficient players in the history of this league. It's funny too, because I think up until recently, and I'm not sure if that's still the case, uh, from a PER perspective, Embiid and, 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 uh, Giannis were, I think, battling for the most efficient season in NBA yeah. history, or it might have been Jokic. I, it was Jokic and Giannis that are battling for the most efficient season in NFL uh, in NBA history. Um, and yeah, uh, I, I I think realistically speaking, it's funny because y'all can't see this, but uh, I I do <laughs> I do want to kind of uh, put a like a nice little bow on this because we do have uh, one more thing maybe two more things to cover and we want to kind of keep this on the shorter side but yeah um like you said the nba is in good hands and i'm not worried about mm -hmm. once uh lebron once mellow once once these players from a previous generation do call it quits um because of of the health of this for the future and like you said you got your trays you got your uh lucas you've got if zion can actually stay healthy your Zions, uh, John Morant, uh, and uh, of course, you know, the best out of that entire 2019 draft class, RJ Barrett. But, you know, let him 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 know. Uh, with that, uh, we also have it's impossible to ignore what's going on right now because it is that time of year. March Madness is upon us, the NCAA tournaments are here, and uh. I think, you know, the only lesson is uh, college basketball is this wonderful, chaotic environment where it is impossible to forecast things, man. That's all I got to say. St. Peter. All you got to say. The pride of Jersey City, New Jersey are carrying the torch right now. for New Central York's Rebels. number one university for basketball. Huge man, not St. John's, not Syracuse, but Is Syrac St. What, what, Syracuse, that scrub school. Have they even ever won a national title? God, <laughs> and what kind of players have they ever sent to the NBA? No one of note, none, not a one. You know what? Wait, they had what was his name? His last name was Anthony or something. I, I don't know. I think he was. Okay, you know. He, he couldn't even be drafted ahead of Darko Milicic, scrub. Man, but seriously, like, you, it's college basketball, men's and women's, especially when it comes down to the NCAA tournament, is the one area where if you are the most logical person, this is the worst time of year for you. Yep. Um... I'm going to go ahead and say this right now. I had Baylor winning the national championship this year in one of my brackets. Oh. Yeah. Um, 
I had UCLA knocking him out in my primary. <laughs> There's a lighter that I use to burn that bracket. And um, yeah, I'm just, it is what it is. I can't relate to you in that sense, but I did lose Kentucky on night one. You know, I just, it, it's a its a very fun time. It's a very fun time. Not in, you know, when, when you think about enjoyment, right? I still remember exactly where I was when UMBC upset Virginia at the first 16 seed to be a one seed, right? When you talk about just pandemonium as a whole, there is no way at that point that anybody had a perfect bracket. There's no way, like, except for maybe the couple people that attended UMBC that, you know, blindly said, hey, whatever, I got nothing to lose. They're going to beat Virginia. Okay. Hey. What about Florida Gulf Coast University over Georgetown or Mercer over Duke? <laughs> I'm pretty sure those were Duke. years in which no one had a perfect bracket after that. Lehigh over Duke. Um, there, there's a running thing, Duke. Um, you know, I, I also like to go back when, uh, you know, 15 C Hampton, Hampton became the first 15 C to pull off an upset over a two and they beat Iowa State. And Jamal Mosley, a tremendous point guard in the NBA for a decade, was on that team. Um, Didn't Earl Roberts also have one as well as a 15 C as well. I believe Earl Roberts had one. Uh, Norfolk State over Missouri was another. Uh, Nick's, uh, you know, stalwart, uh, Kyle O'Quinn, um, his alma mater is Norfolk State. Nick legend, Kyle O'Quinn. Retire the jersey, man. Retire the jersey and his beard. <laughs> um, which is interesting because he's from upstate New York. And, you know, it was it was beautiful watching him not only pull off that upset, but as we play for his hometown team. Uh, you know, it's – I still can't feel the way I want to about being robbed of 2020. Uh, so I feel like at that time, although that team got knocked out by UNC, uh, I feel like Baylor had enough to go back to back. Um, that 2021 national championship game, I will be completely honest with you. I had never seen at a, at a championship level of college basketball witness a team get bullied. Not just bullied, but a team with that much talent get bullied. You know, Gonzaga was supposed to be the favorite and all of this jazz, right? And Baylor said, nah. Wait Shout out me. to being the one dude in the bracket pool that picked Baylor to win the national championship instead of Gonzaga, by the way, which I didn't think was that controversial of a pick. No, not at all. Not but at all. everybody's just like, no, the Zags have it this year. This is this this is a championship team. Nope. And just like, mm-hmm. it's I was- funny – you know, I was watching that Baylor team all season, and I'm like, oh, these guys are strong, and they're just as athletic, if not more athletic than other teams, and they play together. And the way to beat Gonzaga over the course of the last decade specifically is you have to have shooters on the team. Baylor had four shooters on the court starting with another two coming off the bench. Gonzaga could not match that. The year that they played North Carolina National Championship game, what did UNC have? more shooters than Gonzaga did. You know, it's it's been, it's, it's amazing to kind of watch Gonzaga, which may be a setup for a future topic, kind of turn into a blue blood a little bit. They're there. They're always there. It's like you can't have a college basketball season now without a successful Gonzaga program. I was going to say the way to beat Gonzaga is to make sure that Chet Holgram and Drew Tim don't leave the bus, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's how you beat Gonzaga. And those are those are former top twenty-five ESPN high school class players. Chet being number one and Drew Timmy um watching uh Ball is Life, Brad literally make a tweet that Drew Timmy was underrated. Um Drew Timmy was the twenty-fifth ranked player in his high school class. He was the number one or number two player out of the state of Texas in that class. That's not underrated at all. That's you're you're if you're a top fifty national crew, it is impossible to be underrated. I'm confused. Like that 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 part confused me. That was kind of March Madness in itself, but Drew Timmy's development from last yes, year's national can, championship game and now. Who can remember 
you know, who can forget when, you know, poor, underrated, overlooked James Wiseman decided to pick Memphis? <sighs> you know, slipped he slipped under everybody's fingers because, you know, just so unregarded in high school. Yeah, I can't believe people didn't see it. Who are the talent evaluators and why are they still active? What are you getting paid to do? Exactly. How could you not see how good he was? Or like, you know, who would have thought that uh <laughs> who would have thought that Kyrie Irving would have been so good at basketball, right? After only playing like ten games in college, how was gonna hinder his progress in the NBA and this, that, the third? Okay. Sixty points? That was out of nowhere. That's not – we never thought that talent existed. But uh, <laughs> one last thing I real, really want to talk about, and then we really do have to wrap up. But uh, baseball's back. Uh, spring training just started. We got the games underway uh, a couple days ago. And uh, just uh, some initial thoughts about this season, other than maybe, you know, possibly needing a new MLB commissioner. Uh, you know, uh, as, as I said in the cold open, um, Yankees are content with being a uh, competitive but not championship contending team. Usual suspects are at the top. Dodgers, Astros, White Sox, Mets. It needs to be seen. But, like, you know, we'll see how the season shakes out. Um, I think that the American League East is going to be an absolute dogfight again. I think the NL West is going to be an absolute dogfight again. And I think the uh, National League East has the potential to maybe produce more than one playoff team this year. We'll see. Hi there, man. And uh, there. Um, I'm just, just going to say this right now. Mm -hmm. uh, although I'm wearing a Dodgers hat, um, I do like the Dodgers. But man, can I just I I just want the Tigers to be relevant again. Yeah, I just need my Tigers to be relevant again. Uh, we'll see. I really do feel like brighter days may be ahead, but that is unfortunately the White Sox division for the next few years. That yeah. said, I, I think my wish list for this season is the Yankees can't actually contend for a championship. Someone get Mike Trout into the playoffs, please. Like it is criminal, criminal that we haven't get, gotten to see him play meaningful baseball in, in, in autumn. And, and the moment that finally happens is a win for baseball as a whole. doesn't matter who you're a fan of. Mm -hmm. and, and I think more than anything else, if I had to pick a second team to root for this season, it's got to be the LA Angels. Uh, and, and third, the Seattle Mariners, because uh, that fan base has suffered enough and they need to get back to the playoffs. Uh, it's been 21 years and it's too long. But uh, that said, also, I think... I think we're good to put a bow on this shortest episode we've had in a long time. Um, and uh, I'd like to do it again soon, especially since you're living closer to me, ironically enough. Oh yeah. We'll be <laughs> back for sure. But um, with that being said, trash bill podcast will never die. Yeah. Oh, and shout out Tom Brady. This is day 60, man. Day 60. And y'all still haven't replied to a single tweet. It's going to happen. Mark my words. I'm going to look directly into the camera for this one. You will be on our podcast. You will be our best guest, our first guest, but our best guest. Bring Giselle. Bring the kids. Bring the whole family. Make it an occasion. Avocado ice cream. Ready to go, man. We'll roll out the red carpet for you. But this is me to you. Be here. Be our goat on the boat. You like throwing. You like throwing championships and, and, and trophies across boats. Join the Trash Bowl podcast. We have we got plenty of space, man. Yeah, I mean, and one day we may have a literal boat for you to throw the trophy off of. Oh, God, Who knows? A boat. Um, that's the last episode ever. I'm going to be honest with you. We're framing that. Yes. Absolutely. All right, guys. Thanks for joining us. Ken, this is Ethan Nick's Trash Boat Podcast episode. I'll have to go back and check our catalog. Have a great day. And remember, remember, stay goaded. <laughs>